Good afternoon. I always like to put the start time so I know the end time. It's a good thing to know when you're up here speaking. Don't want anybody to fall out of their chair. <laughs> good to see you all. Is it chilly? It's chilly. It was 31 degrees in Tracy this morning. <laughs> Somebody said I was moving back to North Carolina. I don't know if that's true or not. <laughs> I hear it's colder back there in the winter. Hmm. Okay. In April 2015, Anna and I attended a funeral of a good friend who met his tragic death in a car accident on his way home from work the evening before the last day of unleavened bread. 2015, April 9th. Though the reports were sketchy at best, all indications are that it was not his fault. When accidents like this happen, people might ask, why should someone coming home to observe God's holy day be allowed to die so suddenly and tragically? Was this the result of some great sin? Let's turn with me now, please, to John 1. John 1, or John 9, excuse me, in verse 1. The Gospel of John, chapter 9, verse 1. Now Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? I always marvel at that statement, because for some reason they thought the child still in the womb could have sinned, I guess. But it is a logical question when you think about it. Who sinned, they asked. What caused this man to be blind from birth? Well, today we will address the question and answer the question, do we have to sin to suffer? Do we have to sin to suffer? And I think most will agree that a person dying tragically in a car accident is going to cause a lot of suffering for the heirs, if nothing else, for the family, for the friends. And the apostles had the same question. Who caused this to happen? Who sinned that this man was born blind? You know, the apostles asked this question because they understood very basic truths in the Bible. The law of seeds and fruit. The law of action and consequences. The law of blessings and cursings. We're all familiar with these. There are many examples in the Bible of someone sinning and the result was pain and suffering for them or for people close to them. And we should all be very mindful that disobeying God can result in pain. We know that. That's a known. So the first point I'd like to cover today is the law of blessings and cursings as we get into this topic so we can kind of set a background. Point number one, the law of blessings and cursings. And if you go over to chapter uh, Deuteronomy chapter 28, that's a good place to start. If you're interested in blessings and cursings, that's a good place to start. Deuteronomy chapter 28 and verse 1. Deuteronomy chapter 28 and verse 1. Now it shall come to pass, if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God, to observe carefully all his commandments, which I command you today, that the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations on the earth. I like it. Sounds good. I'll take it. Sign me up. Maybe I can be predestined for that. <laughs> And all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you. 
because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. And you know, I love the way that's worded. The blessings will come upon you and overtake you. You're not going to be able to get away if you are obedient to His commands. That's what it says. And then he goes on to list the blessings in the next uh, few verses here. Let me read a few of them to give you the gist of what he's talking about here. Deuteronomy 28, let's start in verse 3, the next verse here. And it says, Blessed shall you be in the city, and blessed shall you be in the country. Blessed shall be the fruit of your body, and the produce of your ground, and the increase of your herds, and the increase of your cattle, and the offspring of your flocks. You're going to have healthy animals, healthy food to eat. Blessed shall your basket, be your basket in your kneading bowl. Your grain will be healthy, will not be depleted. Blessed shall you be when you come in, and blessed shall you be when you go out. The, law, the Lord will cause your enemies who rise against you to be defeated before your face. They shall come out against you one way and flee before you seven ways, complete and utter destruction for them. Because you obeyed God, He's going to bless you, it says. The Lord will command the blessings on you in your storehouses and all that which you set your hand. He will bless you in the land which the Lord your God is giving you. Those are pretty powerful blessings. And we understand obedience has a way of coming out in blessings. Verse 9, the Lord will establish you as a holy people to himself, just as he has sworn to you. If you keep the commandments of the Lord your God and walk in his way, in other words, no, no, we don't want to have you talk about it. We want you to do it. You know, walk the walk, as he says. <clears throat> then all the peoples of the earth shall see that you are called by the name of the Lord, and they shall be afraid of you. Oh, yeah. Don't mess with the big guy. They'll know. They'll know. And the Lord will grant you plenty of goods in the fruit of your body, in the crease of your livestock, in the produce of your ground, in the land of which the Lord swore to your fathers to give you. And the Lord will open to you his good treasure, the heavens, to give rain on your land in its season. And we could use a little of that, couldn't we? Heard recently the snowpack up there is like about 20-25%. Now one year does not a drought make. But it sure would be nice to get a normal year of rain to get back where we should be. And to bless all the work of your hand, to lead, you shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. Oops, <laughs> I think we got that backwards, don't we? We have that backwards. We borrow from all the nations, we don't lend to them. And the Lord will make you the head and not the tail. You shall be above only and not beneath. If you heed the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today, and are careful to observe them. Some pretty powerful blessings for obedience. You will not be able to get away from all these beautiful blessings that he's going to give you. And though the nations called by the name of Jacob were never perfect in obeying God, there was a time when God was with us and we had all those blessings listed in the verse, verse 14 verses of that Deuteronomy 28. But in the last few years, things have kind of crumbled a bit, haven't they? Those of you who are young like me, remember a time when it was better when your children would be safe in school, when you could walk from your home to your school and not worry about being abducted off the street, when you could drive on the freeways and not have massive car accidents when people hit and run. It was a different time, wasn't it? It was a different time. But what happened? Deuteronomy 28, verse 15. Deuteronomy 28 and verse 15, But if it shall come to pass, if you do not obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all his commandments and his statutes, which I command you today, that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. Same words, but now in the negative. 
you will not be able to get away. They will overtake you. Cursed shall you be in your city. Cursed shall you be in your country. Cursed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Cursed shall be the fruit of your body and the produce of your land. You know, with God, obedience is a hot button. Have you noticed? <laughs> he likes people who are obedient, and he rewards them for that. We know that. So you can see that the law of blessings and cursings applies. We can see many examples in the Bible of personalities like Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Saul, and David, and many more. When they obeyed, they were blessed. When they sinned, they suffered all kinds of pain. That's why we read this book, so we can understand and not have to run the course in every case ourselves. I can read the Bible and know that it's wrong to do certain things. I don't have to step up in front of the car to know that getting hit by a car will hurt. I can take somebody else's experience, like from the Bible, and apply it and not have to go through the pain. When these people obeyed, they were blessed. When they sinned, they suffered all kinds of pain. And sometimes the whole nation, if they were high enough in the nation, suffered the pain. What happened when David numbered Israel? There was a lot of pain. There was a lot of pain. And for some, even when they repented, the sin was forgiven, but the pain was not taken away. Sin definitely can cause pain and suffering. And if I were suffering from pain right now, the first question would come to my mind is, God, am I reaping the results of some sin? Because of my experience, I would say that would be the first thing that would come to my mind. God, did I sin knowingly or unknowingly? And if, if I did, tell me about it because I want to repent and get in good graces with you once again. So we know that's a mechanism in the Bible. Fruit, you know, sowing and reaping, fruit, etc. But how do you explain the story of Joseph? How do you explain the story of Joseph? Point number two, Joseph, the man of God. Joseph, the man of God. So anytime I see this pain and I see suffering, I think, well, maybe there's some sin, but... I can point to a specific example, this man Joseph, I scratch my head over this one. Genesis 30, verse 22. <clears throat> Genesis 30 and verse 22. And God remembered Rachel and God listened to her and opened her womb, and she conceived and bore a son and said, God has taken away my reproach. So she called his name Joseph and said, The Lord shall add to me another son. Rachel was Jacob's favorite wife. Yes, men had more than one wives back then, and it was nothing but trouble. Don't do it. <laughs> Nothing but trouble. But there's a lot of treachery that went on to make this all happen, which we are not going to cover today. He was his, but she was his favorite wife. But she could not have children, which also caused a whole bunch of trouble. There were lots of problems in this family. Finally, she had a son. His name was Joseph. Joseph means let him add. He was the favorite son. And he and all his brothers knew it. Have you ever been in a large family? Maybe, and maybe one was favorite. Mom always loved her or him best <laughs> from the smother's brothers, right? Mom always loved you best. Really? How do you know? They knew. They knew. He was a favorite son, and all his brothers knew it. Genesis 37. <laughs> I love reading through this because it's so typical. It's so typical in some ways and so very strange in others. Genesis 37. You can learn a lot reading through the Bible. I highly recommend it. 
you should have on a Bible reading program and go through this yearly and you'll see things in it every time you didn't see before. Genesis 37 and verse 2. Now this is a history of Jacob. Joseph being 17 years old was feeding the flock with his brothers. And the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report to them, to his father. He tattled on his brothers by other mothers. Right? That's what he did. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age and he made him a tunic of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his other brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. This is called sibling rivalry <laughs> in the worst case. Okay? And Jacob did play favorites and Joseph was the favorite. So it wasn't without cause. Genesis 37 verse 5. Now Joseph had a dream and he told it to his brothers and they hated him even more. So he said to them, please hear this dream which I've dreamed. There were binding sheaves in the field and behold my sheaf arose and also stood upright and indeed your sheaf stood all around and bowed down to my sheaf. And his brother said to him, Shall you indeed reign over us? Or shall you indeed have dominion over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. You know, Proverbs 22.15 says, Foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. And he was not a little child, <laughs> but he was a 17-year-old, and he hadn't figured, he didn't have to say everything that came to his lips yet. It was okay to be quiet when you didn't have something to say that was uh, going to cause good things to happen. What he dreamed was prophetic. Telling it to his brothers caused him to hate him even more. The story continues. 37, Genesis 37 and verse 12. Then his brothers went to feed their father's flock in Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, Are not your brothers feeding the flock in Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. So he sent, said to him, Here I am. And then he said to him, Please go and see if it is well with your brothers and well with the flocks and bring back word to me. So he sent him out to the valley of Hebron and he went to Shechem. So you're going to take a little journey here to check on the boys and see how the flocks are doing. But the brothers' flocks weren't there. In fact, he went over there and he was kind of wandering around in the field. Genesis 17, 37, 17, excuse me, 37, 17. 37, 16, let's start there. So he said, I'm seeking my brothers. Please tell me where they are, feeding their flocks. So he was wandering around there looking for them, and a man said, they have departed from here, and I, for I heard them say, let's go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them in Dothan. Now when they saw him afar off, verse 18, even before he came near him, they conspired against him, to kill him. This was a very dysfunctional family. <laughs> In today's words, this should give us all hope, okay? Because <laughs> you know we all have such things, right? Now, I grew up in a family with four boys. Four roosters in the same household is not a good thing. There was what we call sibling rivalry, okay? And it's amazing because we're all over 50 today and there's still some of that. But never was killing each other an option. <laughs> okay. My little four foot 11 mom would have killed anyone who killed any of her kids. Okay. <laughs> Gotta watch out for those little Sicilians, you know? They're tough. Genesis 37 verse 19. Genesis 37, verse 19. Then they said to one another, Look, this dreamer is coming. 
Come, therefore, let us kill him and cast him into some pit, and we shall say, Some wild beast devoured him. We shall see what becomes of his dreams. Hmm. They were still dwelling on that dream, weren't they? It bugged them really bad. But Reuben heard it, and he delivered him out of their hands and said, Let us not kill him. And Reuben said to them, Shed no blood, but cast him into this pit, which is in the wilderness, and do not lay a hand on him, that he, he might deliver him out of their hands and bring him back to his father. Now what was Reuben thinking? I have absolutely no idea. Reuben was the oldest. Maybe he had more sense than the rest of them. I don't know. Maybe he thought that if I pull him out of this pit and bring him back to his dad, dad will give me something, and I'll be a good guy. I don't know. But it was not a good plan because Reuben didn't have control of the rest of them. And things got out of hand pretty quickly. Genesis 37, verse 23. Genesis 37, verse 23. So it came to pass when Joseph had come to his brothers that they stripped Joseph of his tunic, his tunic of many colors that was on him, and they took him and cast him into the pit. And the pit was empty. There was no water in it. Well, that's a good thing. <laughs> if you're going to be in a pit, let's not have one with water in it because you could drown. Sounds good. Then they sat down to eat a meal, and they lifted up their eyes, and look, there was a company of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels, bearing spices, balm, myrrh, and on their way to carry them down to Egypt. And Judah said to his brothers, What profit is there that we should kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh. I guess it's the lesser of two evils to sell them rather than kill them. You have to wonder how these people are thinking at this time. They really hated their brother and they really wanted to get rid of him. And his brothers listened. Then the Midianite trailers passed by, so the brothers pulled Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. And they took Joseph to Egypt. 20 shekels of silver then is about $200 today. They sold their brother for 200 bucks. About $20 each, they divided it up. Wow. Now you may know somebody you want to sell for 20 bucks, <laughs> but, but this was really bad. I mean, can you just imagine what went on in Joseph's head? A 17-year-old sold from your country and your land and your family to Egypt? What great crime did he commit to deserve this? Okay, so he's a little bit arrogant. So he ran at the mouth. He was a little stupid as far as what he was saying and not saying, right? He was foolish. He was a young man. He had not matured. Does that justify the pain and suffering that goes along with being sold? And what about his dad? The old man. We know he really was affected. His father Jacob experienced a tremendous amount of pain for many years because of this. But Joseph was intelligent, and he had some character, even though he might not have had a lot of wisdom. And soon things got better. Pick up the story, Genesis 39. Genesis 39, in verse 1. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Genesis 39, in verse 1. And Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard of an Egyptian, brought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. And the Lord with, with, was with Joseph. That's good. That's good. And he was a successful man. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him. And that the Lord made all he had to prosper in his hand. It's interesting that sometimes Gentile people, unconverted people, can look and say, 
I don't know what you got, but I can see the Lord's helping you on your side. I want you to work for me because everything you touch turns good. So Joseph found favor in his sight and served him, and he made him overseer over his house, and all that he had he put under his authority. You know, like Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Daniel, Joseph did well in captivity. He prospered where he was planted. It was not his choice to be there. He was ripped out of his home and sent down there, but at least he was alive and he was productive. He was recognized for his abilities and he was given an excellent opportunity. His life was probably pretty good at that time because Egypt was a very civilized place and they had a lot of good things there. But change was in the wind. Genesis 39, verse 7. Genesis 39, verse 7. And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast longing eyes on Joseph and she said, Lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Look, my master does not know what is with... Is, excuse me. My math, master does not know what is with me in the house. And he has committed all he has into my hand. There is no one greater in his house than I. Nor has he kept back anything from me except you, because you are his wife. How can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? He did well. Good answer, Joseph. God is with you, you're doing well, you're prospering, and you're not going to succumb to this temptation. He had the right heart, he had the right answer. And even though he was in Egypt, he obviously had a relationship with God. Still, he was able to keep that relationship going. God was with him. So, he should have been rewarded, right? God rewards obedience. Maybe set free. Maybe given a house and a wife. You know, something nice for, for Joseph. Not so. Not so. Potiphar's wife persisted and Joseph was forced to flee her embraces, leaving his garment behind. Evidence. Genesis 39, verse 19. So it was when his master heard the words which his wife spoke to him, saying, Your servant did to me after this manner, that his anger was aroused, and Joseph's master took him and put him into prison, a place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in the prison. So as a young man, Joseph's big sin was probably arrogance, and for that he got sold into slavery. But he makes the best of the situation and he serves his master well and for that he is framed and thrown into prison. Does anybody have a problem with that except me? <laughs> Does that make sense? Aren't we supposed to be rewarded for obedience? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Point number three, the end of the story. Paul Harvey, <laughs> right? The end of the story. Joseph continues in the same pattern. In the prison, he does well. He's put in charge. Seems like he's always put in charge, doesn't he? He had a lot of talent, a lot of innate talent, a lot of ability to produce. And God was with him, and people noticed it. He interprets the dreams of the baker and the butler who were thrown into prison by Pharaoh, and the butler was restored to his position, as Joseph had said, and the baker was killed, as Joseph has said, from the dreams again. And Joseph asked the butler to remember him, to help him get out of prison, but he did not. Rats! Wasn't that going to be his ticket? No. Aren't you supposed to be rewarded for doing what's right? God is obviously with him. He's interpreting dreams for him. What's happening here? Then Pharaoh had a dream. And the butler remembered Joseph, the dreamer. 
and the rest is history. Joseph was restored and put in charge of Egypt, just below Pharaoh, and effectively saved a nation. But most importantly, he was also in a position to effectively save his family and those wonderful brothers that sold him into slavery. <laughs> Point number four. What do these examples show us about sin and suffering? Generally speaking, brethren, doing the wrong thing, sinning over a period of time, will result in pain and suffering. We're not going to deny that in any way, shape, or form. We're not going to make excuses for it. It's the way the world works. It's the way God set it up. Blessings and cursings. It's just the way it works. Exceed the speed limit often enough, and you probably will get a ticket, and you will have pain and suffering. It will cost you in your wallet. It will cost you in your time. It will cost you in your self-esteem. <laughs> it may have saved your life if they cost you, <laughs> caught you before you ended up on the freeway like the four cars did on the way in this morning in Dublin again this week. <clears throat> Doing the wrong thing over a long period of time will usually call pain, cause pain and suffering for you and or for those close to you. It's the way it works. Smoke for 40 years, you're probably going to end up dying sooner than if you hadn't. It's the way it works. We've got plenty of examples. But it doesn't always work that way. It's not always that predictable. Sometimes people suffer and there's no visible sin we can identify as the cause. We must be careful not to judge because we can't always see as God sees. In such cases, we have to deduce that God has a plan for that individual or for those around him. If someone is suffering and you are a son, that's someone being a parent, you may be the lesson, the one getting the lesson and not the one that's suffering. It's not always clear. And Joseph understood. Genesis 45 and verse 3. Now he messed with them a little bit because they didn't recognize him. He was probably dressed up like an Egyptian. He probably, this was many years down the road, he probably changed in his appearance. He probably grew a beard or not a beard like he had before. Probably grew a beard. He spoke Egyptian and not Hebrew. So he was able to fool them for a while, and he did mess with them really good, which they deserved, by the way. <laughs> but there was a time when the revealing was going to happen, when he was going to—he couldn't carry it on any longer, and he just had to tell them. Genesis 45 and verse 3. Genesis 45 and verse 3. Then Joseph said to a brother, his brothers, "I am Joseph." Does my father still live? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed at his presence. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they are at a severe disadvantage here. He was in second in command of all of Egypt. He had the food. He had all the marbles in his court, in, all, in his hand. They were in trouble. They knew it. And Joseph said to his brothers, Please come near me. So they came near. And he said, I am Joseph, your brother whom you sold in Egypt. Oh my, the sin is out. But now do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. All that pain and suffering, all that not knowing, all that going through the trials and tribulations, and everything else that went on. Joseph learned to trust God. He had plenty of time to mature and think about his experiences. And he came to the right answer. Let's continue. Genesis 45 and verse 3. 
Genesis 45 and verse 6. Genesis 45 and verse 6. For these two years, the famine has been in the land, and there are still five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. Remember what he did? He saved up all the crop for a number of years, for seven years, so that they could eat during the seven years of famine. When they had good years, he saved up. And God sent me before you to preserve a posterity for you in the earth to save your lives by great deliverance. So now it was not you who sent me here. You who think you know so much. <laughs> think you had to plan to get rid of me. God. But God did it. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh and a lord of all his house and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. Good position to be in. Now hurry, go to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me lord over all of Egypt. Come down to me and do not tarry. You shall dwell in the land of Goshen and you shall be near me. You and your children and your children's children and your flocks and your herd and all that you have. There I will provide for you, lest you and your household and all that you have come to poverty, for there are still five years of famine. Wow, what a story, huh? Let's turn back to John 9. John 9. In verse 3. John 9 and verse 3. Back to the man who was blind from birth. John 9 and verse 3. And Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the very works of God should be revealed in him. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he said these things, he spat on the ground and made clay with the saliva, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And he said to him, Go wash in the pool of Shalom, which is translated sent. So he went and washed, and he came back seeing. Do you have to sin to suffer? Sometimes. If you sin, sometimes you have to suffer. But not always. Not always. The best example we have of Jesus is Jesus Christ himself. Hebrews 4. Verse 15. Hebrews 4 and verse 15. Let's start in verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest, Hebrews 4 and verse 14, who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. Verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Hebrews 5 and verse 7. Hebrews 5 and verse 7, just over on the next page. Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears for him who was able to save him from death and was heard because of his godly fear. Jesus Christ did not want to go through that painful death, but he knew that was part of the plan. Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Jesus Christ 
lived a perfect life, was sinless, made no sins, had to suffer. How else could he know what it was like being a human being like us if everything was just smooth in his life? Yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. Like Joseph and the blind man, Jesus suffered too. And in his case, totally without sin. But God had a plan. God always has a plan. His plan was for Joseph. His plan was for the blind man. His plan was for Jesus Christ. His plan is for each of us today. We find that plan written in the pages of the Bible, and that's why it's important that we read God's Word every day. Getting into God's Word helps us understand the mind of God and the plan of God for the world, for the nation, for us individually. So, in conclusion, does one have to sin to suffer? Not necessarily. Can sin and sin can and frequently does cause suffering? for the sinner and or those close to him. But, because we see suffering or tragedy does not mean that the cause was some great or secret sin. So then, what's the purpose of suffering? Given that God has a plan for each of us, brethren, we can only conclude that we or people close to us are to learn from our experiences. What I always do is say, God, if there's something I need to see, show it to me quickly because I don't like pain. <laughs> and he usually does. And then we can make changes and then we can move on. We heard this scripture read in the previously, but we'll do it one more time. Romans 8, 28. It's a good one to end on. It's a good one to pull out when you are in pain because it's truth and it has stood the test of time. Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things, all things, even when we are called to suffer, even when we are called to go through trials, all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to His purpose. Verse 31, what then can we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? <laughs>